we have is a study claims that the variance in the heart rate of smokers is different than the variance in the heart rate of non-smokers. Makes sense to me, potentially anyway. Um, the sample variance in five smokers is calculated from a you know, we met, we ask take their heart rate, figure out what the, the sample variance is in that heart rate of five smokers, we get 545. The sample variance in five non-smokers is 103. Test the claim at a 0.01 level of significance. First of all, you need to understand what is going on. You have smokers and non-smokers, and the theory is, or the claim is, that the variance in the heart rate is much higher for smokers than uh, for non-smokers, or not that it's much higher, that it's much different. It could be higher or lower, but it's different, okay? Um, now, to me, 103 looks a whole lot different than 545. So based on the sample data we have, I'd probably think that it's true. But you can't make that claim without doing a full-blown test because you're doing it at a 99% level of confidence, and that's, uh, that's a pretty high bar to jump over, so you're not going to be able to just guess the answer without doing it. So the first thing you do is you write down your data. First of all, you have group number one, which are the smokers. And we're going to call that group one, all right, just because we're going to have uh, sub one, sub two running around here. And in group one, we actually sample N sub one, which is only five people. And we find out that their variance in the heart rate, which is not the average heart rate, it's how much the average heart rate is different from the mean, how, the spread of the, of the heart rate, the spread of the average heart rate among those people. And we get a number of 545, pretty big number, pretty high spread in that data. Uh, then we have the non-smokers. And we're going to label this uh, group number two. And then what we say is that we have N sub two, which is how many people we, we choose from there, which is also five, and S2 squared, which is the sample variance there of 103, 103. Okay? So again, just kind of looking at it, these look awfully different. So I'd probably say, man, it looks reasonable to me, but we have to write down the claim and the alternate and the null hypothesis. So what is the claim? It's actually written right there in the problem statement. A study claims the variance is different. It doesn't say that it's higher or lower or less than or greater than. It says that it's different. So that's your huge clue that the alternate hypothesis uh, is that sigma 1 squared, the variance in the heart rate from group 1, the variance in the heart rate of group 2 is different. That means they're not equal to one another. And that means that the null hypothesis, which is the mathematical opposite of the alternate is that they are the same. So we have sigma 1 squared equals sigma 2 squared. So either the heart rates are the same statistically or they're different. The default or the null hypothesis is that they are, they are the same, but the claim is that they're different. And the other imp uh, important piece of information is that the, uh, look at this, the claim has an M in it, uh, that the level of significance is 0 0.01, which is really high, 99% level of confidence, right? So what we want to do at this point is draw a picture, draw our rejection regions, and then calculate the boundaries for the rejection regions from the tables, and then figure out from our data where, where the test statistic is, and then we'll either reject it or we won't. So we go over here and we write down and just draw a little sketch of a table, or of a graph, I should say, of the F distribution. I do this for every problem. So here's the F distribution, here is zero. Now what we have is a two-tailed test. You always look at the alternate hypothesis, which has a not equal sign. That means it's two tails. That means the tail to the right is going to have an area under it, not of alpha. This is gonna have half of alpha, which is alpha over two, right? And there's also gonna be a tail to the left that has the other half of alpha over two. So we're gonna call it uh, alpha over two that fits right there. So that is just by nature of the fact that this is a, um, this is a, um, a two-tailed test. Now if alpha is 0.01, let me ask you a question, what is alpha over 2? 0 0.01, if you take that and divide by 2, what do you get? You get 0 0.005. So that means the shaded area off to the right is going to be 0 0.005, and the shaded area to the left is 0 0.005, because they have to add together to give you the level of significance of your problem, which is 0 0.01. Now, all that remains is to figure out what this value of f is, and what this value of f is, the critical boundaries, and then we'll, we'll proceed from there. So this one, we call it f sub alpha over 2 for a two-tailed test, because it has an area of alpha over 2 to the right. We call this one, F 
sub 1 minus alpha over 2 because it has an area of 1 minus alpha over 2 to its right. Remember, alpha over 2 is to the left, so 1 minus alpha over 2 is all of the area to the right. It doesn't matter what you call them, I just want to know what the f values actually are. So, in order to do that, we're going to have to do a little bit of, of uh, calculation. Nothing too hard. Um, but what we need to do is first figure out what the degrees of freedom are here. So the degrees of freedom for our test statistic is S1 squared, S2 squared. But the degree of freedom of the numerator uh, is going to be what? How many samples did we pick from group number one? Only five. So five minus one, which is four. And for the denominator, the degree of freedom is only, again, five smokers. So it's going to be five minus one, which is, again, four. So we have four degrees of freedom for the numerator and for the denominator, all right, which is kind of nice. All right, now what do we do? How do we figure out what the, what the critical value of f is here? Well, first of all, you want to be careful not to go grab a table that has alpha 0.01 in the top because that table is going to grab an f value out that has an area of 0.01 to the right. But you don't want that. You want to find a value of f that has 0.005 to the right. So you have to go grab a table that gives areas 0.005 to the right. So you're going to have to go dig around in the back of your book or online or wherever. You'll be able to find a table of values that are, that are giving, you might see it labeled as alpha equals 0.005. So go ahead and use that guy. And then you use, for the numerator, you read across the top four degrees of freedom. For the denominator, you read down the side four degrees of freedom. So let's go and do that here. We have this table right here. Notice that alpha is 0.005. Here are the numerator degrees of freedom off the, off the, um, the uh, top here, and the denominator degrees of freedom are read down the side. So what we're really trying to find is f sub alpha over 2. So we have the right table, and now we have 4 degrees of freedom for the numerator, 4 degrees of freedom for the denominator. So we go here and we see 23.1545, which is a big number. So we write down 23.1545. So that is one of the boundaries of our um, that is one of the boundaries of our rejection region. So it's 23.1545. Now that was an easy one really because we just grabbed a table that's giving us this area to the right, so we just read it right off of there. For the left hand, we have to do a little math because this alpha over 2. 0 0.005 is to its left. So we've done this enough times, but just keep in mind, typically you read numerator all across the top, denominator or down the side. We're going to have to flip it around, denominator across the top, numerator, but in this case, 4 and 4 are exactly the same, so it doesn't matter if you flip it around, I guess is what I'm trying to say. But I just want to point out clearly so that you know what we're doing. So let's go ahead and calculate what is the value we're trying to find. F sub 1 minus alpha over 2 is what we call it. Now, because we're doing a left tail test, we have to do that reciprocal. We're pulling out a value of f, and we flip numerator denominator, so we're looking at four degrees of freedom in both cases. So normally it's numerator common denominator. We flip it around, but really the numbers are the same. So four and four, we already grabbed that number. It's 23.1545, but to find this value, it's one over 23.1545. So what we find is that f sub 1 minus alpha over 2, we just take 1 divided by 23.1545, and we get 0 0.0432. Fairly small number, 0 0.0432. So then we go up here, and we go, this value is 0 0.0432. So now we have our rejection region set up. If our test statistic falls way over to the right, we'll be in this rejection region. We'll reject the null hypothesis. If our test statistic falls anywhere way over here in this rejection region, we will reject our null hypothesis. If our test statistic remains anywhere between these two points, we will fail to reject the null hypothesis. So we have to calculate the test statistic. All right, so let's go ahead and do that down below here. The test statistic is F which is S1 squared over S2 squared, which is S1 squared, the variance in group number one, variance group number two is 103, so on the top we have 545. On the bottom we have 103, and when you divide those you get 5.2913. Where does this fall? Well, if this is 0 0.04, that's a really small number, and this is 23, then the number 5.29 is somewhere here in the middle. It is not in the rejection region. So let's just go ahead and write it down. Uh, we'll call it right there. We'll say f 
is equal to 5.2913, which is in the fail to reject region. So what we say is that we fail to reject the null hypothesis H0. And this is the answer. All of this work is done just for you to circle this one sentence, to fail to reject it. But what you have to do some, some talking about this. What you're doing is you're failing to reject the null hypothesis at this level of significance, which is very important. What you're also saying is the evidence does not support the claim. The claim is that the variances were different. The evidence does not support that claim. Then you look at these numbers and you say, well, they're very, very different. How can we reject this? Why is this not true? Why is that alternate hypothesis not 100% correct? There's a couple of problems with it. The biggest one, I think, is that you're doing this at a 99% level of confidence. You have a very high bar to jump over. In other words, these numbers have to be extremely different in order for you to actually fail to, in order for you to support this claim, basically, um, because the, the bar is set very high. Think about what would happen if you changed the level of significance. Instead of 99%, you made it. 90 or even 80 percent. So what's going to happen is this, remember, is a shaded region, really small shaded region to its left, and this number, this critical value, has a very small shaded region to its right. So if you kept everything else the same and just changed the level of significance, making it 0 0.9, I'm sorry, 0 0.1 um, or something like that, making it 90 percent, let's say, level of confidence, what's going to happen is this shaded region is going to be bigger. So you're critical value is going to move to the right, and this critical value is going to move to the left because that shaded region will be bigger. If you move the goalpost far enough, this F value is going to stay the same. If you move the goalpost far enough, it'll be in the rejection region, and then you can make your claim. But at 99%, it's tough. So you can't say with statistical significance that it's true. The second thing I'll say is you're testing smokers and non-smokers, but you only looked at five people. That's why the numbers in that chart were so big and weird. We haven't seen any problems with huge, uh, huge numbers like that because five people sampled is just not enough. Would you take a drug that was only tested on five people? No, of course not. You want to see hundreds or thousands of people. You can't make decisions based on small numbers of people like that. Or if you do make decisions based on really small numbers of people, then you better have extremely different values here. So incredibly different that it'll drive this test statistic way off into the rejection region. Like maybe you have 600,000 over here and maybe three over here. That would be pretty different. Then maybe you could, you could reject that null hypothesis. But not now, not with the data we have. So we fail to reject the null hypothesis. We say that there is not enough evidence to support the claim at this level of significance. But if you change anything else in the problem, you might get a completely different answer. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.